does what the Father commanded him to say. Or he only says what the Father commanded him to say. Remember that? Yes. The only thing that he will say is what he was told by the Father to say. So he would only say those things. And that's found in John 12, 49. We won't look at the scripture, but, but we just need to be reminded. Second, that he only does what he sees the Father doing. He only does what he sees the Father doing. Now, we don't see the Father doing anything because he's invisible. But Jesus can see using um, a figure of speech that only us who are, well, we can see things, right? Because we're human beings, because we're uh, physical, we can see things, but uh, in the Spirit, Jesus sees what the Father is doing. That's in John chapter 5, verse 19. Now we'll go to John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. This is the story of the wedding at Cana. Uh, and we need to remember these two things. Jesus will only say what he was commanded to say, and Jesus will only do what he sees the Father doing. Okay? For us to understand the story about the wedding in Cana and how that impacts us. So sometimes we read the scriptures and, ah, oh, it's a good theological story, but it doesn't apply to me. But we need to take these stories and apply it to ourselves. Amen? Amen. Okay, so we can walk out there and know what we're supposed to do. What we're supposed to do. So, let's start off with chapter 2 of John, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Now, on the third day, third day of what? It's the third day of that wedding feast. Now, wedding feasts in Israel during that time, it lasts a week. Now, who wants to get married? And, you know, he wants to get married. He goes, are you willing to spend for that seven days, for that one week? Absolutely. <laughs> That's a lot of money here in Las Vegas, right? But I am so in love with my sweetheart. All right. And this was the third day of the wedding. That's not even the fourth day or the fifth day or the sixth day. It's not even close to the end of that wedding. It's only the third day, right? And they have a problem. Now, how would you like to have a wedding feast, you know, a reception, and then you have a problem right in the middle? Of course not, right? Especially the women here in this country. <laughs> Jesus' mother was there. Now, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Now, was Jesus' mother invited or was she part of the people who were preparing for the wedding? We don't know. But it says here, Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. So they were there. Jesus' mother, Jesus, and his disciples. Now, actually, later on, we'll find that even his brothers were somewhere in the vicinity. We don't know if they were there at the wedding or some, just somewhere in the vicinity. Verse 3, when the wine was gone, third day of a seven-day wedding feast, the wine was gone. Now, how would you like to have a wedding feast and then halfway through, you run out of food? Or you run out of something very, or punch. You run out of punch. Yeah. Right? The third day, the wine was gone. And Jesus' mother goes to Jesus. Mary, let's call, just call her Mary. Mary goes to Jesus and she says, They have no more wine. They ran out of punch. <laughs> and Jesus, in verse 4, says, Woman, now, here in America, when you say, woman, <laughs> you know, it, it, it doesn't reflect respect, right? Now, you can say mother, and you can say mother, <laughs> and it means something, right? Or you can say mom, it just depends on the intonation, right? In, in Greek, it's totally different. This word woman, 
does not mean any kind of disrespect. So we would translate this to mean woman rather than woman. Why do you involve me? And Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. It's not yet my time. As far as Jesus was, was concerned, it's not his time yet. Right? Now, let's go back to those two things that we know about Jesus. One, he only says what the Father commanded him to say. Right? Second, he only does what he sees the Father doing. Now, did he see the Father turning water into wine. Not yet, not at this point. Did he hear the Father command him to say, let's turn the water into wine? No, not yet. Okay, so the story at this point is that Mary, his mother, had some kind of, well, we don't know, was it motherly instinct? Was it because she was involved in the preparation? Was it because uh, she knew what the father really wants to do? Yeah, she, she's not Jesus. And so Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. But his mother takes off, goes to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Obey Jesus. Now that's one of the things we want to tell people is that we need to obey Jesus rather than someone else. Amen? Amen. Do whatever He tells you. Now, what did Mary know? She knew something except that maybe she just, she just couldn't put a finger on what she knew. And she just says, hey, obey my son. Verse 6, nearby stood six stone water jars. Those are big jars. And each jar contained 20 to 30 gallons of water. Because these jars, this is not the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. So they take the water, they wash their feet, or they wash themselves. And this happened to be standing near the feast. Amazing. These were used for, by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now how many gallons does your car, your car sign, have? You guys have no? Huh? Do you know? Mine has 10 gallons. It's a Corolla, it's a small car. That means this, each one of these jars contains two to three times more than my car out there can contain. 20 to 30 each piece. So there are six stone jars times 20 gallons, that's 120 gallons of water. If you have one of those five gallon containers, that would be what? 120 divided by five? That's 24, right? 24 containers, 24 big containers of water. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of wine. <laughs> right, Herschel, you like that. Quality wine. Quality wine, that's right. This is, this is vintage. <laughs> Now we, we're not there yet, <laughs> so let's not get ahead of ourselves. Verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, now, now by this time Jesus had heard the Father, and Jesus has seen, had seen the Father. Amen? Amen? So he says to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Now, if you were a servant, you would think, okay, what are they going to they do? They ran out of wine. And now they're telling us to get some ceremonial water? That's the only thing that you can think of. These are ceremonial jars. So they got some water. I don't know how long it took them to get 
you know, 120 gallons of water, and they filled the jars to the brim. And then he told them, now, draw some out, take it to the master of the banquet, and they did so. Now, what? You take some water out, this is ceremonial water, and you go to the master of the banquet, and you give it to him. What do you expect? You expect only water. What's he going to do with the water? Right? Is he going to wash his feet or someone else's feet? Is he going to wash his hands because it's time to eat? They've been eating for three days, remember. So they did that in verse 9. And the master of the banquet tasted the water. Right? And they know this is for ceremonial, ceremonial washing. And he comes and tastes the water. He probably thinks it's wine. So he tastes the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't know this. He did not realize where it had come from. If he only knew that this wine came from the ceremonial jars, he probably said, why are you giving me this? So he tastes this water. And though the servants who had drawn the water knew, and then he called the bridegroom aside. Now these servants, they didn't know what they took. They probably looked inside and said, how come this water looks red? Okay, first day of the feast, you bring out the best wine, and then the second day, you bring out the cheap wine, give them to Herschel. <laughs> <laughs> but you have saved the best until now. You have saved the best until now. This is the third day. And he says, wow, what are you doing? Why did you say the, the, serve the cheaper wine at first and now the better wine towards the middle of the feast? You have saved the best until now. Amazing what God can do. We may have had some really good years at GCLB, but wait. If God wants to serve the best wine, He'll serve the best wine. Amen? Yes. But the problem is with God, you don't know what He wants to do, right? He, 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 normally, you don't know what He's going to do. You may understand what He wants, but you don't know how He's going to do it. Like yesterday, we were using our new MP3 player and we were having a good time just singing some songs and then suddenly shuts down. <laughs> Whoops. So we gotta take that to seven. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs. First of the signs. The first of the signs. This was actually the very first miracle, public miracle that Jesus did. First of the signs through which he revealed it's a revelation. It, the root word is similar to the word epiphany. Epi meaning the, the prefix to the main word, which is phaneo uh, or patphani. Uh, this one similar, except that this particular word in the Greek is a revelation of not just the appearance, but the character. It's a revelation of the character of Jesus. Now, when we see a revelation of the character of Jesus, we see a revelation of the character of the Father. Let's always remember that. If we want to know who the Father is and what kind of Father we have, we look at Jesus. Jesus. Amen. That's right. We look at Jesus. He is the Son. He is the express revelation of the Father. Problem is, we look at other things, we look at other people, and we don't get a complete picture of the Father. We don't get a complete picture of the Father in the Old Testament. That's why Jesus had to come. And when Jesus came, He gave a complete revelation of who the Father is. This is a revelation which He revealed His glory. The glory of the Son is the glory of the Father. Wow, through, through wine. 
through the changing of water into wine at a feast. A feast of people, not just Pharisees, not just religious people, but probably a feast of people who doesn't care about the law. Sinners, tax collectors, and all kinds of different people who want to get drunk. Right? And Jesus was reputed to be someone who was a wine bibber, a drunkard, a glutton. And he creates his first miracle right in the middle of a feast where people got drunk and got stuck. Yeah. It's like Jesus came to Las Vegas and his first miracle was in a buffet. <laughs> Or you can order margarita, right? For two bucks. <laughs> and his disciples believed in him. Can we believe Jesus by seeing what he does? What can we learn from this? Number one, we need to wait for God's timing. Sometimes we want to do something for the Lord, but the Lord says, well, it's not yet time. Hey, listen to me. Talk to me. I want to show you what I'm doing. I want to tell you when to do it and how to do it. And that's what Jesus always did. He always listened to the Father and he always did what he said, saw the Father doing. We need to do that too as individuals, as children of God, as followers of Jesus, and as a congregation. We need to listen to God, and we need to look at what He's doing. And we all do that in the Spirit. We can't see it in the physical. We see that in the Spirit. So wait for His timing. Always wait for His timing. I waited six months until I was received a dream from God saying that, hey, you need to apply for the job. I said, what? Really? <laughs> you know that story, right? You know, we, we get so used as, especially ministers, we get so used that uh, you got to dress up like a minister, walk like a minister, talk like a minister, and we got to put in programs here and programs there and programs everywhere, and we want to do what God wants us to do, so we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and it doesn't materialize. That's because it's not God's timing yet. First of all, we need to see what He's doing so we know what to do rather than do this, option A. And maybe it's not even option B. Maybe God has option Z. What is God's choice? There are so many options out there that, you know, either way we can just say, well, God's going to bless this. Okay, well, God said, yeah, bless that, but really, you really ask me? I want you to choose option Z. Or option AA, which is after Z. <laughs> Wait for his timing. Let's go to Isaiah uh, chapter 40, verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. This is from the uh, uh, New American Standard Bible. I think it has better translation towards the end. God doesn't get tired. Well, we get tired. I get tired. I'm just a human being. It's a difficult job. Because the job of a pastor is not meant to be placed on the, on the shoulders of any one person. Any one physical person. 
because that job belongs to Jesus Christ. And he's the only one who can carry the burden, not us. We've, been, we've just been asked to be the dogs, the shepherd dogs out there. And he's the shepherd. His understanding is inscrutable. Verse 29, he gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Anyone here who's sick and tired and weary and burdened? He gives his strength. He gives might. He increases power. Verse 30, though youth grow weary and tired, no? You know, we, we watch the Olympics every four years, and here are so many athletes, most of them are like what? Teenagers and in their 20s. You'd, you'd be too old to box as a 30 year old. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, Glenn? Are you still a boxer before? <laughs> <laughs> so, even youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly. Verse 31, yet those who wait those who wait, let's say that together, those who wait, those who wait for the Lord will gain what? New strength. New strength, amen. They will mount up with wings like eagles, they will run and not get tired, they will walk and not become weary. It's in the Lord, only in the Lord can we do this, but if we go off on our own, do things on our own way, then expect to get tired and weary and burdened and probably depressed. We don't want to get depressed. And if you're depressed, you know, just come to the Lord. Surrender everything. We need to surrender a lot of things in our lives. In order for us to cross the threshold and come into the place of rest. So what can we learn? Second thing that we can learn. Do whatever He tells you. Don't try to do something on your own, but do whatever He tells you. If He tells you to fail, draw, and serve, then do that. Fail. Fill the uh, jars to the brim. Draw. Draw water. Actually, it's already wine. Draw wine from the jar and serve. All we need to do. We don't need to change the water into wine. That's not our job. It's His job. He tells us what to do and when to do it. So just fill the, fill the jar, then draw, and then serve. And then next thing, all we can do is behold the glory of the Lord. Just watch His wonders. Amen? Amen. Now we can use this, right? This is very important and encouraging that it's God who's going to do it. It's not us. And this is one thing that I'd like to share with you. You know, we're going to the next level right now. This year, we're going to the next level. It's not about attendance. It's not about the amount of income that we get here as a congregation. That's not what the Lord wants us to focus on. He talks to Gideon. He says, how many people do you have? You got 10 pounds, you got too many people. Take them to the water and let's find out who's worthy to be in your army. And he ends up with how many? He ends up with 300. You know, we've, tried, we've been trying to do things our own way. Let's see what God does when we do it His own way. Let's do it His way. So let's just fill, draw, and serve, and then behold. Be still and know that I am God. Let's watch His wonders. Let's watch His signs. Let's see what He's going to do. And then we give glory to God rather than ourselves. Amen? Amen.